Hey guys, it's Robert here. If you haven't had a chance to go back and listen to episode 339, which is part one of this two-part series with Sean Jarvis, please do that now. Go back and head over, listen to episode 339, then come back here and listen to the second part. Great story with Sean, who was a former Sergeant Major, spent over 20 years in the Army, multiple deployments, and we got a chance to sit down and talk about a number of different things. Hope you enjoy this episode. Please be sure to subscribe, hit that bell so you can be reminded when our next episode comes out. Help support the show out at patreon.com. Please be sure to share our show, leave a comment. Thank you guys so much for listening to this. Draper Award in SLC as an individual, and I got the Draper Award for, and in the scout world, somebody will probably correct me, but at the time, what was being told to me was the Draper Award was, it was how you got promoted, right? That's, yeah. like, if you're walking away with Draper Awards, you're probably looking at promotion, because it's it's the leadership that they, that they see through enumeration and quantification. Yeah, these metrics, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so... You know, I could be out there licking windows, but if the numbers are right, <laughs> obviously I can scout. Oh, absolutely. And the windows were delicious. <laughs> by the way. We um, had uh, two very interesting commanders during that time, too, because we had... Uh, three. We had Kevin. Yeah, Humphreys. Humphreys. Okay, Humphreys was the man. The man, the myth, the legend. Kevin Humphreys is a le- legend. At Kevin Humphreys, former... Anyway. I'm just going to... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give his bio real quick. Former Ranger, 375. Um Never left Fort Benning, seems like, up until captain. Anyway, uh, sniper with 375, um, OCS, Benning. Um, went back to 375 as lieutenant, which is, I guess, unheard of. Did some time with them. They're like, hey, Kev, you need to go out and do some real army stuff. So they make him something over at 3rd Brigade, 3rd ID, Benning. Um he goes through the maneuver captain's career course, Benning. He becomes a commander at, that's right, Benning, yeah. Bravo 3-1. Don, this is Don Fox all yes, over again. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, and he is the most unorthodox commander, War Eagle, Auburn fan. Auburn fan. I'm a huge Auburn fan. I work there, by the way. Um, War Eagle, and I. everything he did was on Post-it Notes. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Everything that he did was on a post-it note, and that's how he kept up. Um, Tactical genius, good old country boy from Alabama. Just him on a small arms range, you will forget more in that time, but just because he teaches so much. Yeah. And as a captain, like, you can tell he was an old NCO because, you know, you'd see fives down there, you know, in the prone with their Joe and look on the other side, and holy shit, the commander's down there with Joe too. Yeah. Just getting in some sergeant's time training. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was, it was a fantastic leader. And he rolled He rolled out to Proctor, who was the youngest commander in 3rd ID at the time. Jonathan Proctor. Another amazing. So I learned a, <laughs> I learned how to be a first sergeant. Let me, hold on. Let me back up. Okay. We skipped all of Fort Drum. Oh yeah, sorry, man, sorry. Because I, I got a, I've got a lot about Fort Drum, but I won't get into a whole bunch. But at Fort Drum, I showed up as a staff sergeant promotable, and they were like, "Oh, you're going to be the land and ammo NCO." I was <laughs> like, "The fuck I am." <laughs> um, I went and talked to the sergeant major, and I said, "I just found out that there's a position opening up for a platoon sergeant at Tenth Mountain for their their PSD." And they're getting ready to deploy, so I'm going to go ahead and drop my name off of that. Because mind you, I just graduated Master Gunner School. I I had the top percentage of Master Gunner School, but I had one counseling statement for being late, and so I automatically got disregarded for that. So I left Master Gunner School hot and not in a good way. Um, they shut down First Infantry Division or First Armor Division in Germany, yeah. and that's when they're moving it. And so I I had a three year assignment to Germany. And they cut it down to two. Master Gunner School graduate. I get on with Branch. Branch is like, you're going to drum. Okay, that's cool. So I just graduated Master Gunner School. Yeah, we need we need 19 Delta Four. 
at, at Drum. It's like, there's not even a Bradley at the museum <laughs> at Drum. What? Drum doesn't even have a museum. No. Like, what? Yeah, we need a four. You're going to do go do unstabilized gunnery. It's horrible. It's not real gunnery, so, by the no. way. Thanks. No. I, had to, I had to, yeah. So I show up to 189 Cav. They are deployed. So I show up to the rear D, and that's when they're like, yeah, you're going to be landing ammo. So I do landing ammo for like a week. And the Sergeant First Class that's there that's running the rear D just swears up and down that I'm going to be landing ammo for the rest of the time. I was like, that's not, it's not going to happen. So I talked to the Sergeant Major that's there. Sergeant Major's like, no. He's like, what if we give you a platoon down in Bravo Troop? I'm like, that's, I mean, that's what's up. That's all I ever wanted. So I take over for one of the platoons down there. The platoon sergeant, who's got a family living in like Syracuse, is sleeping in the office. This is incredible. Like he's got a cot. He's got, and so it's that type of platoon sergeant that's so embedded with his Joes because he's living there at the barracks. Yeah. Which means that he's kicking it with the Joes, which I guess isn't bad, but I mean, he just doesn't know anything but 189 Cav. Yeah. So now I got to take over for this guy. And then on top of that, I get a brand new platoon leader who is branch detailed, I think, as a scout. But he's like, I think he's commo or intel or I forget. Not saying that he's not good. I'm just saying that that wasn't where his heart was at. And and so there's a difference, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Sometimes. mm -hmm. But he's still hard charging, right? Um, Something happens. I think the commander for Bravo Troop bless him ends up getting a DUI I think they're coming back from like a Halen farewell and he gets pulled over so he's out the door and then the first sergeant is his time's up anyway and he's out the door so they bring in this this young captain Captain Robert Furtick Ken Furtick from division and they bring him down he's a good old country boy from South Carolina and Sergeant First Class non-promotable Jarvis we're all like throwing over like, Hey, who's going to be the first sergeant? They're like, you can have it, Jay. <laughs> You're only going to be there for a couple of months. We don't want that responsibility. So remember Desi Arnaz Johnson? Yep. Yep. Desi was a platoon sergeant with me nice. there. Desi would have taken it, but he was going to ALC. Yep. And so it just fell on me. 18 months later, non-promotable sergeant first class Jarvis is still the first sergeant for Bravo Troop. 189 but in my mind i was killing it in retrospect i was killing it because of captain furtick so captain furtick was prior nco and he was just the most down-to-earth guy who i saw his first kid not literally born but i was there for his first kid all the way up through his youngest now and they're still great friends of mine i consider them family they're coming to the wedding nice. with all three kids so he and kelly brought me in as a young NCO, taught me how to be a first sergeant, right? And we would speak all the time. He was the first person that taught me that there's no such thing as officer in NCO business. I was like, well, sir, but he's like, mm-mm. We don't play that right here. No. I was like, you're right. It's communication. <laughs> it was. It yeah. was, you know, he taught me, it was the who else needs to know concept. Mm-hmm. He said, when, when, you, when you try to create this delineation between the NCOs and the officers, you lose some now that doesn't mean that you don't use the right chain to communicate but that doesn't just because you're using the right chain doesn't mean that you get to hold back on communication yeah smart yeah he said good leader if you decide for your this is what he was teaching me if you decide for your soldiers what they need to know then some of your smart soldiers aren't going to fulfill to their max potential yep so if you keep filtering what you think they need to know, what you think is important, which at times is important, um, he said, you, you're going to lose out on performance potential. He said, that'd be like me holding out information on you. I was like, oh, all right. All right. Got me. Yep. Got him's me. That's so it. anyway, I did. I had to bring it back to him because he he established he helped me establish who I was as a first sergeant because I was young. I made a lot of mistakes. It was a sergeant first class in charge of other sergeants first class. Um, it was tough, you know. Did did some rotations. Did some. It was it was tough. So broke my neck in a motorcycle accident right before we were supposed to deploy, and that's when I became the rear D. Yep. 
for Sergeant. I learned a lot there for 12 months. I'm leaving drum with a total of like 32 months of first sergeant time. Still a, not promotable. As a non-promotable sergeant first class. And I've got all the naysayers are like, you're never getting picked up. Huh? Well, that's what you said about making it to sergeant first class. You said you don't have any platoon sergeant time as a sergeant first class. Or you don't have any section sergeant time as a staff sergeant. You're never going to get picked up. And I got picked up at Master Gunner School. Below zone, whatever we called it. What mm -hmm. was it? Primary list. Primary. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> secondary. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. So you were on the secondary. Yeah. It so, got picked up. So I leave drum, very successful, get a degree. Like I've, I've redeemed myself, right? Broken neck, rehabilitate myself, um, get to Benning and go to the first arm training brigade at three, eight, one. Now, Captain Furtick is now, I think, Major Furtick. He's down there at Benning. I meet him down there. Um, I have no idea where I'm going. I just know that why am I at the armor training brigade? Like, cool. this cannot be good. Because nobody, I was like, is this my take in the time? Right? Is this my broadening assignment? Yeah. This is where, and this is where we're coming back to the Maneuver Center for Excellence. They're just opening up the armor school. So everything's brand new. We're still trying to, you know, find our ass with both hands. It's really weird. And I just know that I'm going to get picked up for mass art and that I'm never, I'm never even going to have to touch some instructional time. And I was surprised when I didn't get picked up. So, and then I found out that I was going to be running the hand grenade range. <laughs> so I said, I pissed somebody off. Yeah, I was like, this is karma money. for the DUI. This yeah. is exactly what yeah. I thought, right? This is karma for the DUI. Um, I was like, but that's okay. I I nug through that. What I found out was is that they changed the eligibility for mass art. So I didn't meet the time and grade requirements. So I didn't get picked up based off of merit. But you're already, a, what, three years in? Yeah, it was like I missed it by like two months. Oh, I was going to say. Was, it was wow. the dumbest shit ever. Oh, I mean, okay, yeah. Because remember, I was I was just a staff sergeant promotable when I got to drum. Oh. So I didn't get picked up in okay. pin until like a month or two later. And then like a month after that is when I picked up the first arm time. So I got promoted in like November and then I picked up the, the first arm position. Hmm. So I, I just, it was just like this whirlwind. There's so much in there. Um, yeah, so I end up at, at Benning as a hand grenade OIC. That's, and, that's a special kind of hell. But, you know, I met, once again, I met some really good people. Yeah. I met some really, really, uh, Emma Shaw was there, Lloyd Taylor was there, David was there. I mean, and these guys were, uh, Matanzing was there. And we were all just like this team that had to deal with the CSM that was just a knucklehead at the armor train brigade. I won't say his name. He was just really hard to deal with. And, you know, we're doing what we can to establish something. And his expectations are pretty lofty. He was a type of NCO that would walk in to a troop level, platoon level office and not mentor, but berate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like I, remember, I know those guys. I remember him walking in and we had an older NCO that was running our, our BRM ARM and he came in and just lit his ass up about how he was too old and he's not going to get promoted. And what are you doing to create the program? And, and then he started getting into like the, the brass tacks of what ARM was. And, and we were like, this is horrible. I don't like that guy. So, you know, um, there's the next promotion list comes out and only two of us make it. It's me and Matanzing. Matanzing is the first sergeant at the time and I'm running the range. So out of like the entire brigade, we're the only two to make the master on list. And so obviously, naturally, I'm going to go to third brigade, third ID, where now we're caught back up. Yeah. Sorry. That, no, was, no, that, was, that was the jump. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't leave Ford drum out of it because there's a lot. There's a lot of growth yeah. there. My, well, so my fiance, that's when I first met her, was at yeah. drum. It was at drum. Okay. Yeah. So I've known her for over 10 years. Was she in or Sabine at the time? Sabine. Sabine, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I've got I'm I'm keeping a lot of my social life out of this because it it's relevant but it's not. Mm -hmm. Right? Um it's not I mean the motorcycle accident, broken neck, I'm glad I survived, snapped my C seven, probably shouldn't be walking, but I quit smoking back then. That's the big pull from that. <laughs> so I was smoking like a chimney. So I quit smoking. Um 
transitioned to drum or excuse me, transitioned to Benning and uh, I do get promoted to first sergeant, which is awesome. But once again, I'm in a rear D role when I show up. I, I mean, I, I can't win, but, but it's only rear D because they go to NTC. So they don't want me oh. to go to NTC. I take them over for 30 days. For 30 days, I do all this improvement. Andy Helms is there. Yes. So Andy Helms. Uh, he just retired. The longest uh, round of applause after a chain of com- or change of command I've ever heard. And because he brought all the NCOs into the motor pool uh, down there at three one, and it had to feel good to him because all the NCO we clapped probably for three minutes straight, and like this dude was, he was he's fantastic. I'd follow him to the gates of hell. He's got he's in books. <clears throat> he's in like you know like tank battles in Iraq. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah he's like, that guy. like the big one, like the big one, mm. like the one that you read about. I don't. I don't want to say. I don't know if there's copyright stuff in there. Yeah. So, but anyway, he's just. He was the captain that commanded the tanks that just went out there and, and rocked, and did things that just. Aren't like there was be a, in there the was a, there was a run that happened there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, famous tank battles. He's at the, the like he's there. So, um, man, what? And he's so awesome. It was. It felt like when I got there, it felt like an all star team. When I got there, and I, and the revelry that these dudes had for the senior leaders of that organization. Yeah, yeah Hummel was the CSM. Yeah, even though after Hummel, we kind of went through some turmoil with the sergeant major position. Yeah, you know he passed away far. No. Can I can I can I hit you up on something real fast? So Stephen Farr was going to be our our next CSM after Hummel. Some. Something happened with him where he got removed from position. But he was a great CSM for me. And as a first sergeant, he had my back always. He ended up passing away um, because he was running. I want to say he was running the target in Auburn. He ended up passing away a couple of few years back wow. in April. Yeah. Damn. I caught wind. Damn. So, and... Um, yeah, rest in peace. Yeah, Stephen he was a, he was a great dude. Big uh, big softball aficionado. Like yeah. he was the one that would travel around. I think he was sponsored by Mike and yeah, like like. But anyway, passed away. That's when we got Stevie Jones. Well, uh, Jones had the longest command sergeant major time as, as an as ops sergeant, sergeant major. major. Um, he was yeah, he was three seven. Yeah, for uh, ever. Yeah, he was awesome. And then we got Daniel Pinion, the man, the myth, the legend. Daniel Pinion, who I respect. Oh, I respect the dog piss out of that guy. Um, Daniel Pinion, man, I can't. I can't say enough about him. And and he's got a book coming out. That's fantastic. I know it's beautiful. He uh, he spent some time in. Correct me if I'm wrong. Ramadi was so. where he was. Um, he had a bad go in Ramadi. Has a lot to talk about. Um, was very open and honest. He was one of the first senior leaders I've ever heard talk about PTSD in front of a formation. Um, would be very open and honest. Hey, I'm going to – it's it's that time of the month. I'm going to mental health. Yeah. And he told everybody, hey, mental health appointment went great this week. Um, I recommend you guys go. Yep. And he was – oh, he was, he was awesome. Now, if you got on his bad side, he would – chew you up one side and spit you out. But it felt like more like a dad talk, kind of like, you know. Yeah. Um, he cared about his motor pool being clean. He cared about guys doing PT. And he cared about people doing things the right way. He was the don't just show up someplace. Right? Yes. The motor pool was big for him because people would just show up. He's like, okay, so now what are you going to do? So you're here. Don't be that guy. Don't just show up. Right? Do something. Yeah. Right? People don't care that you're there. I don't care if you're here. What are you doing while you're here? All right, cool. He was also the guy that's like, hey, do simple things, but do them right. Yep. Hey, why are you parked in the grass? Is there a line over there? I'm serious. Yeah. Like, is there a line? All right, cool. I want to know who that soldier is because they're going to guard this grass. Because we're, But then he was the guy out there painting lines to make sure everybody mm-hmm. understood where the lines were at. So you're a soldier. You can walk. You know what we did on Mondays? We, we marched to the motor pool. It was Old school. Yeah. And he recommended that a five, like an E5, More. was leading the formation. Yeah. Because these guys don't get it. Like I was a five then, and he was like, these guys don't understand what drill and ceremony really mean. Mm-mm. 
And so we would like, you know, for someone to put a five up there, say, hey, get us to the motor pool. Yep. And you better be singing cadence because we're motivated because it's Monday and we get to do this again. Yeah. <laughs> it was different. <laughs> but but the amount of knowledge that people gained from the simple things that he was doing there, I don't think people understand what he was instilling. Right. Re- reinvigorated the sergeant's time training program, reinvigorated the soldier of the year program, which I – one NCO of the year under his tenure. Nice. Um, so, yeah, he was, you know, looked at me and said, Sergeant Neal, you are the worst soldier of the year I've ever seen. And I said, thank you, Sergeant Major. But I did it. I mean, he, <laughs> and he was over it. You know yeah. what? It, 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 it is what it is. Yeah. And there's nothing – you couldn't say anything because all the questions that – he was on the board. Tony Towns was on the board. Um, God, Tony Towns. Uh, who else? There, there were two or three other sergeant uh, – who are now Sergeant Majors were on the board. Who was the old Bravo – before you took over Bravo, he was HHT when you were Bravo. Um, well, that was Tony, but then you're talking about um, the dude that always liked to eat yard bird. We got yard bird. He was a tanker. Mm-hmm. Oh, what's his name? Anyway, come on, man. I got all, skinny. All those dudes are star majors, but they were all on my soldier uh, uh, NCO of the year board, yeah. and it's just the pedigree of three one Cav. The pedigree of of I me. Mean, so, man. Um, Lavaris Jackson is now command sergeant major is now taking over first calf was the, the armor CSM just recently was the, I mean, you name it. He was there. He was over a uh, two, one calf yep. when he was down there in, in Afghanistan with me. Um, he had a brigade. I forget which, but he had Vanguard, I think. Anyway, what I'm telling you is, is we were first arms together and he went from being, um, a two, six, nine, First sergeant, I believe it was. He ended up being the HHC brigade first sergeant, and then from there just rocked Tony Towns. He had a maneuver troop, and then he took over HHT, became a CSM, became a sergeant major, I should say. Um, me, I had Bravo troop, took over HHT, you know, went off to do Auburn, and then sergeant major academy. The pedigree that came out of that it wasn't. It wasn't by coincidence. I mean, obviously, we built our careers up to that point. But the way that we were stacked was stupid. It was dumb. It was. I'm, I'd never. I don't think that people realize the amount of master gunners were in those formations. It, so it would. It would. They took advantage of it being a binning, and they were. And you know, we went and won. What was the cup in so, Canada? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we won no, the no, Sullivan no. Cup well, too. Well, we got third place. Not so Sullivan Cup, but. We got third place in the best scout competition. Yeah, <laughs> the the Ganey Cup. The Ganey Cup. The inaugural, the one that that uh, Nick Ganyan didn't want to do. Oh yeah, <laughs> good old Nick. First one, I want to go to Airborne School. Yeah, no, you're gonna do this. Hey, how about you get in my office? <laughs> We're gonna start with get your ass in my office. <laughs> Nick's like my little. He's like my my surrogate son. I love Nick. No, Nick dude. is a master sergeant now. You know that? Are you serious? Yeah, he's the Citadel. I bet he still has jacked up hair, Nick. If you're listening to this, I bet your hair's still jacked up. The man is swole. Is he? Yeah. And he's got a fiance. He's getting married. Nice. The man that we never thought was going to get married is getting married. Wow. He's got a bulldog. I think he owns a home in Hawaii. Yeah, he went he Growing. did he did Benning, Alaska, Hawaii, and then Yeah. He did all the right things. Yeah. He did all the things. And he's like he's like jacked. He was skinny. This is the kid that used to be a like pro motorcycle motocross dude. Oh, gotcha. Weighed about a buck twenty five. Yeah. Cocky was, as shit. Very good at his job. Um, and knew it, and so kind of rubbed people the wrong way. Yeah, I did like knock had, him down a couple times. Had bro hair, stuff yeah. like that, so, you know, that's why I made fun of his hair. Like, Yeah, PC was kicked back on the head, hands yeah. in the pockets. Used to like to smoke soldiers because that's the way he was taught yeah. to be a soldier, right? Right, right. That's His first meeting with me is when I he was at the TMPRC, and his load plan was jacked up, and so he had, like, his driver and his loader and his gunner were, like, doing – drills on that berm right behind the mm-hmm. and I was like come here Kanye <laughs> so you think they're going to want to put that Bradley back together after you've had them low crawling for the last hour well first aren't they uh, so the answer is no Kanye <laughs> yeah. so if you want to teach them how to do it then get in there with them yeah. and do it and then you can talk about how you can you know their punishment shouldn't be getting all sweaty and nasty because we're going to have to be out here for another 17 days how about right you teach them how to do it and then show some accountability that's my leadership style my leadership style yeah. was completely different than everybody else's mine was like the if they're late for work 
why are you making them come earlier? They were late the first time. What makes you think they're going to come 15 minutes earlier successfully? <laughs> How about you have them come in at the right time, but you put them in charge of accountability now? Yeah. And it's not a punishment. Now you put them in a leadership position, and then hopefully they learn from that. So then when you do do some sort of administrative punishment, it's based off of a leadership failure on their part and not because they, they, they made them late. wear a right. stupid alarm clock around their neck. Yeah. Right. Right. The goofy stuff that used to go on back in the day. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, I, it's that old school leadership, though. And and do it because I said, so I, I have the rank, you know, hiding behind that in a lot of cases. You yeah. know, it's not truly learning how to be an effective yeah. leader that's going to play outside the military as well. Walrod was always very, he always thought it was very important to give you the why. Yeah. Whether you were his driver, E1, or you were a team leader that he was mentoring or a section leader that he was in charge of. It was, this is why we're doing it. Yeah. And now you go, guys, you guys go get your stuff ready and how you think you need to do it and then come back and let me know. It feeds into accountability and purpose, right? Mm-hmm. If... If you're telling me leadership, right, provide purpose, direction, motivation, how? <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Provide purpose, direction, and motivation. But there's verbal, there's nonverbal, mm-hmm. there's hand and arm signals, which is still nonverbal, but it's kind of verbal. <laughs> how? <laughs> is it a foot in the ass? Am I giving you donuts before you do this? Like, how? Right? And so Walrod was big on the, the how. I was big on the how. This is how we're going to do it. But, and then that's where you get into, God, I got so many, so many thoughts. Um, When you do a disciplined initiative, right? So I won't get into too many big army terms because then I'm just getting braggadocious and showing (laughs) my, my acronyms, but use that disciplined initiative. Basically what I'm doing is I allow leaders, leaders because I am allowed by my, supervisors to go within a left and right limit Mm -hmm. make sure it's more empowerment there we go right moral ethical Mm -hmm. right and then it's meeting it's going towards the end state Mm -hmm. but i'm giving you that that leverage to do what you need to as a scout we need that yeah right it's not always going to be land it's not always going to be range cards yeah yeah range card of life here you go or of leadership so what i tell people is 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 from the scout perspective it can't always be route reconnaissance. Mm-hmm. I can't always just drive down the road, right? There's some areas in there that I need to touch. There's some zones in there that I need to touch, right? But but most importantly, I got to check those lateral routes yeah. because some of the important things are in those lateral routes. And But you're always getting to the same place. Yep. You just have more information about it. If I've got three people and I tell all of them to do specifically one thing, I've lost out on those lateral routes. Mm-hmm. Everybody drove down the damn road and you missed everything in the wood line. And I don't need that. I need people who can think on their feet. I need people who can do land navigation going 50 miles per hour in the top of a turf Bradley with, without fear and knowing that they can accomplish it. And then, you know, somewhere in there, they've met the end state. Mm-hmm. I need that. Mm-hmm. Cause that's what I was allowed to do. I was the guy in the top of the dirt doing 50 doing land navigation to Bradley with a, plexiglass board screaming into my boom with the, with the leaderboard yeah. or the yeah slow it down yeah. slide the ass <laughs> out yeah. um i learned a lot as a first sergeant i learned to love the army as a first sergeant um i learned the difference between coddling and um effective mentorship i used to as a s- section leader and as a platoon sergeant i would get emotionally invested with my my subordinates and then as a first sergeant, I tried to keep I tried to keep it real. I knew I wasn't gonna know everything because, you know, people aren't gonna let dad know everything. Yeah. Um, I wasn't trying to be everybody's friend, but you knew when I was disappointed. So um you, I I you know, I I tried to lead by example. I tried. Uh PT. I was huge into PT. I was huge, but but it made sense, like to the point to where we did a lot of functional training. We did nothing but functional fitness. Yeah, but but what I was trying to get people away from were the the wall rods of the world that were running fifteen miles every Monday, like no doubt. Right. 
I, I understand why he did it. The people have a tendency to do things that they're strong at and, and they don't ever want to push their thresholds. They're lactic thresholds, right? Yeah. And I forced leaders to show weakness in front of people. And it was uncomfortable for a little bit. But then once they started getting good at their weaknesses, it wasn't uncomfortable anymore. It was fun. Um, got interviewed by the Army Times mm-hmm. because of it. I, every, and this is just not now I'm going to brag. Every senior leader that came down to the brigade, even though Sergeant Major Green liked and disliked me, we had a love hate relationship. I learned a lot from him too. He he would bring them to me. Yep. Um, and we do PT with us. I mean, all the way to the core CSM. Yeah, we had. I remember I was in a formation in front of Brigade one day, <laughs> and what was the name of the core? 18 Airborne Corps CSM. Yeah, I forget his name. Dude just jumps in the formation. He looks like Joe. Yeah. He looked like an old staff sergeant. Just like this dude. What is he? Crusty. Like, what is this dude doing? And then someone looks up and goes, Hey, Sergeant Major. And then we all look over and we see he has a little name tape on us. Like, yeah. Yeah. And then we proceed to just get torched for the next hour and a half. Yeah. Just, was, just begging for Sledgehammer to come on. Yeah. It was fun. It's good times. But I, I redid the PT profile, the profile PT. Mm-hmm. And then I had to do a, um, I did, I did do a, a class NCOPD to all the other first arts on why I thought mine was better. Green's like, you can tell them about this. I was like, all right, right after gunnery. Yeah. So I'm tired, but we're gonna do this. And my my vision for profile PT wasn't mine. It's basically what functional training is about. That is, if you can't get to a certain level, then you need to scale it. You need to deload it. You need to change it but you're still meeting the intent. If we're doing anaerobic, then find something anaerobic, but just scale it down, whatever. So if I got a lower leg injury, then I'm still going to find something for you to do with the upper body. We're still going to get, you know, without oxygen type of exercise in. It doesn't mean you have to run 18 miles every Tuesday to try to get it in because that's not anaerobic, mm-hmm. right? That's just breaking your soldiers off. They don't like to run. That's it. And they don't want to do PT anymore. But here's what I got out of that, right? Where at any given point during the day are most soldiers together? PT. Formation. For first formation. formation. Yeah. <laughs> if you're broke and I, you know, I say two sergeants take charge, and the first thing he says is, All right, profile PT, fall out. I've just disconnected that person from his family yep. at the beginning of the damn day. Yeah, very true. And you can't get that back yep. because what you've done is you've instilled camaraderie for the guys that did run 18 miles. Yeah. And now there's a little bit of animosity for the guy that's, oh, he's malingering. Yeah. He's not one of us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. And he's so, weaker. You're going to have to build yourself back up to get back in here. Yeah. You know. And so we're naturally segregating our folks. Yeah. I said, no, you're not doing that. So I started with taking the profile PT people with me in my HHC group or my headquarters group. And I kept everything probably within a hundred meter radius of the troop. I'm like, well, how are you going to get fitness like that? I, I, I don't know. How about you do PT with me? And I would break folks off, but I wouldn't do it. It was the, the scheduled exercises and how we did it would break. They broke themselves off. I never barked at anybody. No. We didn't do stations like to the point to where I'm yelling at folks. I'm doing PT with you. There's nobody standing in the middle of a circle. It's this is the standard. This is what you're going to do. If you have to stop, this is what you're going to do when you stop. And this is the time limit. Here's the difference. I need you to write down either the time, the load, how long it took you or, or, you know, how many repetitions you got. Because we need to be able to revisit this. Look, if, if I don't challenge you now and we don't note that down, then you're not going to remember for next time. What's your push? Yeah. There's the why. There's the why. Right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So then I had people walking around with notebooks. <laughs> but I loved it. I loved it. People were writing it down. Oh, and they come up. I first want to check it out. I, you know, I lost this amount of body fat. But, you know, I got this this workout in, and, and this, I improved my time. That's, that's amazing. I had people, they were, like, gaining muscle but losing time on their two-mile run. It's awesome. And good for you. So I, I was getting people that wanted to get off a profile to do PT. Yeah. I was getting people that were, 
I was getting people from other troops. They're like, "Hey, can yep. I be in Bravo?" Yep. <laughs> that was but, a big. That was a big thing. Like when someone got the got the chance to come to Bravo. Yeah. Like they were like, finally. But you know that you're you're talking. You're doing a lot of name dropping. Both of you guys about guys that were special that taught you leadership skills that were. Um, from their past lives, whether it was because they were a ranger and they be mm-hmm. people are shouting your name, you know? Yeah. I, More than likely your name is being talked about in mm-hmm. certain circles when guys get together and go, Oh man, you remember. And, and it's because that's what, that's when you know that you were a good leader. It's not because you want to be talked about, but it's you, you passed on something and helped somebody grow and become better. Yeah. That's leadership. Yeah. It's not about you. Yeah. It's not the accolades of, hey, look at me, look at me. It's no, look at him. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, I'm so proud of this guy. Like you did when that guy came walking up, you know, dude, I'm more proud of you than you think, you know, but that's what they wanted. They wanted your, they wanted your pride. They wanted you to uh, feel proud of them and what they were doing at the same token. You just wanted to lift them up. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. It's. I brought up the Ganey cup. No, not the Ganey Cup. I brought up the the Draper Award for a reason. I didn't write it down because you know, I'm having a good time just talking. But the the Draper Award, the reason why that was important was is that my why wasn't chasing an award. Captain Humphreys and Captain Proctor, their why wasn't chasing an award. The why was was creating a base of knowledge that could be passed on to anybody else that came in Mm -hmm. so if we can create that base right that baseline for what what right looks like and the army provides that with with all the documents that we have in the army we always provide a baseline of what each modal is supposed to be infantrymen you're supposed to do this at every level but what we fail to do is we fail to implement that and so that's what we were doing was going back to the basics and implementing it. And Kevin Humphreys was the perfect person to tell you that because he knew the basics and he knew what it was to be a pimp. He was bringing you back to the basics. Yeah. He said, look, I know how to do this. I know what it is to be sexy. I know what it's like clearing rooms and blah. You don't need to do all that. Hey brother, do you know how to shoot? Yeah. Hey, how about we get back behind some iron sights and learn how to shoot? Right or learn how to properly use a T and E. Yeah. Oh, oh. And like if you're painful. If you're not pulling the slack out of your T and E, just junior soldiers right now. If you're not yeah. pulling the slack out of your T and E, Kevin Humphreys is is disappointed in me. Yeah, he's looking over your shoulder yeah. right now. And I don't mean like an angel; like he's alive, but yeah. he's a ninja. He's <laughs> yeah. looking over your shoulder, what, like watch your back. Um, I'll tell you. Uh, so this is where Sergeant Major Green. This is why I liked him. Is he held senior leaders accountable? So we would do squad competitions as senior leaders. It's like first arms and above. And he'd go out and just smoke that tail for three days. But part of that was, you know, learning how to shoot. So battle site zero. We showed up to the range. This is where this is where it ties in, even for me, learning from somebody like Kevin Humphreys. We go out, you go up to the range, M4, you've never seen the weapon before. Hey, you've got 18 rounds, you got a battle site zero, and then based off of that zero, you're gonna qualify on that C target, right? I shot 39. I battle sided with 15 rounds. My sexy ass put those extra three rounds in my magazines. <laughs> for, for the call. <laughs> They're like, yeah. how'd you get 43 out of that? <laughs> but what that tells you is, is that's not just me being able to shoot. I'm, right. You know, I, anybody can learn how to shoot. Yeah. That was me going back to the basics, learning from somebody like Kevin Humphreys, and then instilling that foundational knowledge to every, but then using it myself all the time. Because we had senior leaders in that group that were not qualifying, that didn't know how to battle site zero. They couldn't group or know, learn how to, like grouping, you know, they'd fire three rounds, immediately get up and go down. I'm like, how about you fire your six? Or what is it now, five? I don't know, just do it by the, what do they call that, um, book. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, oh. right? It, and, it, and that's all it is. It's, it's, you don't have to recreate the wheel. The army's done it for you. If you don't know how to set up the tent, guess where that shit's at? It's in the back with the tent. It's on the, it's probably on the tent. Yeah. But you're right. Yeah. It's there. How much uh, tire pressure do we need? I don't know, dumbass. What's that 32 mean on the wheel well? Yeah. Right? 
<laughs> the army allows you <laughs> yes. to succeed. It does, yeah. It really does. But what we do is, is because of the competition, because they'll always want to be better, we're always recreating it to be more efficient, to be re- and that's what Kevin did was he just brought it back. He brought it back. He didn't need, you know, Microsoft OneNote. He needed post-it notes. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying you got to go all the way back. Yeah. Right? He took it all the way yeah. back. But but it's just a it's it's learning how to utilize the systems that you own to get super great at them. And yeah. then once you're once you're an expert at the basics, yeah, master the basics. Then then you can try to be you can find efficiency within the basics. I find that same thing to be true now, even in the private sector. If you can do the basics and if you can get really good at it, then execution becomes so much easier. And I mean, you got organizations out here that, you know, 70, 80 percent or greater of organizations fail at achieving their strategy. Mm -hmm. It's because they lack the basics and understanding and how to improve upon that and finding ways to execute on the strategy properly. It applies in the uh, private sector and the civilian side as much as it does the military. I, I've got, so with that, they don't achieve it. Why? That's a very they didn't broad understand the strategy. Who's they? The people, everybody. Who's they? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing at him because he'll, yeah. he's going to go, oh, shit. Right. I would have soldiers come back to me and they said, S1 said they wouldn't take my paperwork. Who's the? Who's, who's S1? Well, them. In the no. office. Which okay. person? Which person in S one? Well, it was private. So, well, that's your fucking fault. Because yeah. private so and so just got out of basic training, and he hasn't or she hasn't read the manual or doesn't know how to do this, and they're just listening to Fennell. Fennell, I love Fennell. You know, Fennell's a yeah. master sergeant. He's what? He's a master sergeant. You know, he's probably going to the academy. Oh, nice. Yeah, Fennell's beasting. Nice. Dustin, by the way, shout out Dustin. Um. Dustin's probably the the worst example I should use because he actually did it the right way. But he said, "Well, Dustin told me, or you know, Sergeant Fennell told me to do it this way. What the book tell you to do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I get it, right? Yeah. That's, that's so. When you say they, yeah. that's my question. They and the they is are the individuals that you entrust to execute that strategy." So whose fault is it? Is it the person executing the strategy or is it the leader explaining strategy but not giving you enough um, why behind it or left and right limit behind it? So the yeah. army, we it's either it's either mission command or command and control, right? Mission command, I'm giving you the leverage to do what you need to do. You get you know discipline initiative, go off and go forth, meet end state, or is it command and control where I'm like, alpha troop, I need you to move from this grid to this grid. I need you to set screen while they set screen. I need you, bravo, you're going to bound, move, terrain features. Right now I'm command and control, right? Civilian sector is like, we're trying to be nice. I'm going to tell you how I want to do it, but we're going to use a lot of nice words in there. And I'm going to try my best to give you a left and right limit. But it's going to be real fluffy. But they have mm-hmm. no idea. And they have real no gray, real oh. gray. And so yeah. you lose the strategy. And why I know that is because me going in the civilian sector, I tried to make things that I thought were inefficient more efficient by being inefficient. I was inefficient because I was trying to recreate something, and I was spending more time trying to recreate it than just going back to the, base. the basics. And yeah. the basics were the document they give me, use it, and just because it doesn't look the way that you like it doesn't mean it doesn't work it's just not the way that you like it retired sergeant major get over it and that's my struggle now yeah no no no. you're absolutely right i think that vagueness is part of the problem i mean i've been um a period of time consulting with uh, companies and what you'd see is that if you if i asked you know if i termed your strategy as true north which direction would you point and, and what you end up finding is that people are saying, well, I think the strategy is this. This is how I interpret it. Well, then you got a parable. If people are reading this in a way in mm-hmm. which they're interpreting th- themselves, yeah. then you don't have a really solid strategy. Yeah. You That's know, what that I was going to add. It could be the person executing the strategy. It could have been the person that came up with the strategy. Or it just could be the strategy. And it could be it could be a combination of all, yeah. all three. Yes. Yeah. And then that's where your perfect storm comes in. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all of them create an unknown. 
Yeah. And then when you're trying to create a strategy, unknown shouldn't be in your vocabulary. And this doesn't matter whether you're in the military or civilian sector. You've got to understand this type of basic and making sure that everybody that you lead understands where you're going and why you're doing it. Yeah. And their purpose in that whole process. You got to look back briefs. Got to have back. Trust but verify. Trust but verify. I, 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 there's a lot of uh, terms. So right now I work for Ernst and Young, big plug. Um, it's a big four professional firm that does a lot of, you know, consulting, auditing. So I work for the assurance auditing side of the house as an experience manager. It's a fancy way of saying resource manager, um, consequent, not consequence management. It's, it's, you know, strategic implementation. This is big words, strategic implementation of client servers to, um, best serve the client and the firm, um, you know, in to, terms to, of like bis- business continuity and risk management? Well, uh, it, for us, is in terms of profit margin. But, gotcha. You okay. know, in terms of the individual, it's in terms of meeting like um, PCOB, SEC, um, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Guidelines, like they're meeting, yeah. you know, the Enrons of the world bring auditing yeah. business, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, Sarbanes Oxley. So for those who don't know, Enron was a company in which everybody invested in this company that worked for this company. Yeah. They put their, their trust in the 401k. They put their trust in the stock of the company and it was abused. And this company ended up going down and all these employees and everybody lost all this money, shareholders, yeah. the whole bit. Thus Sarbanes Oxley came around and Sarbanes Oxley is supposed to hold everybody accountable now every leader has to at the top that manages the fiduciary responsibilities and board and you got to sign a document that says you're going to go to jail and if yeah. you're not following proper procedures and you're not documenting mm-hmm. everything according to those procedures you know then yeah. where the, you're going to be held accountable that that a word that nobody wanted to hear back in the day so it so- socks 404 um you know those are those are accounting terms that are coined because of you know what you just explained it's you've got multiple professional firms out there that do you know auditing at, at many different levels um i won't shout out the competitors but you know who you are but <laughs> uh ey does it better um I, I what i'm doing is i'm learning a lot about the accounting world and more importantly i'm learning a lot about myself and i you, you follow me on on facebook uh, no, I'm not. I'm, Are you not on the socials? I'm not, not on the socials. You know, I, I made a He's comment. On Instagram. I'm on Instagram now, but. <laughs> All right, well. <clears throat> that's, that's for the podcast. Follow me, bro. I'll follow you, bro. <laughs> um, I, I, I put a comment out there because I just hit my one-year anniversary with EY. And doing resource management, I mean, in general terms, I put people where they need to be based off of, you know, their skill set and, and rank. And, and, and EY uses words like deployable, non-deployable, which is amazing right yeah. in the field like they actually talk about that stuff so you know the transition was pretty easy when it came to that and then doing all the things that i did as as a senior nco it's made it it's made it pretty cool what i generally said and somebody can probably fact check me on this one is you know you gotta you gotta take your humility and and pull it out and then take your pride and put it back in that tough box where it was i said because nobody cares that you were a sergeant major mm-hmm. they, i mean a couple people might, but at the end of the day, they're like, cool story, bro. Where's my analysis? Yeah. Right. And that's what it comes down to. And I, and then I also made the comment that says what you think, you know, about Excel, you don't, I said, there's more and it's angry. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, this you know, last, at EY, you got the guys that run Excel just with their hands on the keyboard. They don't touch the mouse. No, it's nasty. Yeah. It's they're the just macros. Like, just, you want to take like this and like pivot, pivots and like oh, you're having a seizure. pivot table, pivot table in, in the EY world or in these professional firms is, is a necessity. Yeah. And that's, that's basic. Yeah. Like we're just splicing information. These macros are flying everywhere. You're getting slapped in the face with information. You ask for something, they're like, it's in the table, bro. Like, yeah. oh. V lookup. Yeah. Let me just. <laughs> oh, God, God. Yeah, it's bad. Wait, uh, wait, wait. I got to take you guys out of this hole. So so let's move forward because um, we could probably go in like another three more hours. And yeah, definitely going to have to have you come back. And so we can talk about, I, I can hear just so many different topics. And I can only yeah. imagine what's in that book. But I do want to talk about SFAB. Yeah. Which we haven't oh, touched yeah, on. Yeah. SFAB. Um, S fab, this, these are my, you can, you can look at all my, see that's this color coded. This yeah. is what, 
This is what uh, OCD and ADHD look like in the academy. <laughs> this is very cool. It's a well, blessing and a curse. Actually, so, it's very well organized yeah, and uh, I, I, you know color coded and. Yeah, I hope you got a missing page. That must be driving you crazy. No, because I, I had to go to the acronym. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> See how that works. There you go. Don't try to get me, man. <laughs> um, SFAB. So I'm at the academy. Um, you know when you think you're a big deal and then you leave your small town mm. mm-hmm. and you're not a big deal anymore? That's the academy. So, you know, I was that proverbial big fish, small pond. Yeah. Um, you know, thought I was good. And then you go to the academy and you realize that this is the the less than 1%. And, and you're like, shit, man. I should probably step my game up. I thought I was good. These guys are better. These gals are better. I mean, you're... Wow. I And, and, and as much as we make fun of the academy, everybody's human. You're going to have a small percentage that, that shows their ass and... and I get it, Sergeant Major, this, that, and the third, and they all suck, and got it, all right? I'm telling you the amount of talent that shows up to the Sergeant Major Academy on an annual basis is ridiculous, and this is why I think America is so great at what we do as far as, you know, conventional Army stuff and and, and leading soldiers. Um, like I said, some stray, and I get that. Yeah. But we're going to talk about all the great things that people do. I I was humbled to be there. Um, At one point, I felt like I didn't deserve to be there. But I think we all kind of do that when you get to a certain level in life. Um, And I felt like I needed to step my game up. I mean, Shade Monday, Command Sergeant Major Monday, was just the first Cavalry Division Sergeant Major. And he's about to take over Recruiting Command. Yeah, He was in my class. That's awesome. (laughs) I mean, this is the impact that people are making, right? LeVar mm-hmm. Jackson, Command Star Major, about to take over one one CD, was just the armor CSM. He was class 66. I was 67. Oh, yeah. he was in uh, class with Lewandowski then. Yeah. 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 So you see, I mean, it's like you've got the Sar, Sar Major of the Army is in there somewhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, and just chilling, waiting. And they're going to come out the cut, and they're going to be they're going to be amazing. The difference is... It becomes so much more political. So no, we don't go there and learn how to yell at people to get off the grass. When we go back, talk about the foundational training. PT isn't skipped. Like you go out there and you're in formation and you're learning how to do PT all over again. It was like PLDC, mm-hmm. right? It's yeah, like, it's learn like the basics. Else. It's learn the basics. Then it's not because they're insulting your intelligence, but they're bringing you back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it'd be mm-hmm. like taking an old scout and teaching them how to do land nav again. I would welcome that because you know who the worst people are to do land nav when you take them to institutional learning? It's a scout. Yeah, it's terrible. All day long because we have the worst habits. Terrain association, that's what it's all about. No. I mean, learn your pace count. We're going to dead reckon. Yeah. Like, no, oh, no, you're reckon it sucks. Do they even do that nowadays? Or they actually take a compass and a map and go out? And put them in the woods. I would hope so. I know ROTC does. Yeah. I hope the guy there yeah. NCOs. Yeah. And if you're listening to this and you haven't done that with your troops, mm-hmm. one day load them up in a five ton, get them somewhere, get them out in the woods, put them in a spot, tell them to look at the map. You know, yeah. Say you got to get here. I'm going to be standing there waiting on you. And yeah. yeah, and don't remind them of the GM angle. Yeah, I was about to say that. <laughs> um, I mean, most people just can't get past magnetic north, yeah. let alone grid north. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. you know, when do I add? When do I subtract? I don't get it. <laughs> Knowing your pace count. Oh, yeah. Does the water in the toilet below the equator <laughs> exactly. go counterclockwise? And then the dew on the cow. Knowing, so, knowing that you stray as you walk. Yeah. We all do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where's your drift at? Yeah. yeah. I got the long right leg. Yeah. What is the um, D street distance equals speed over time? If we got a hustle in the woods, Bro. what does that mean? You know, like, you and these are guys that we were, we were teaching this to guys as like specialists. Well, I mean, yeah, too. And it was one of those things like, hey, man, uh, we got to do these counselings at the end of the month. Take them in the woods and show them something. Good to go. Got it. Old school. So when you left the academy, um, the academy was fun. I lost my identity at the academy. 
I probably became an alcoholic at the academy. Um, and this is that real stuff that I told you I was going to tell you, right? Unfiltered. Um, you go from being relevant in mm -hmm. your own mind to an individual trying to find your relevancy. Yeah. Right. So surrounded you, by all stars at the same time. Yeah. Cause you're not, nobody's standing in parade rest. And Kyle will tell you, I never got off on that. I'm not the parade rest type of dude. Right. It is all about military courtesies and mm -hmm. custom, customs and courtesies, but I'm not like, don't, it's, it, that wasn't me. Yeah. I, I got, you know what I mean? You want to impress me? Knowledge. Yeah. Right. Tell me, tell me what you know. Show me what you know. Um, and they were doing that at the academy. And, and so, yeah, I felt like I was playing catch up. Like, organizationally i was top notch um learning how to study writing papers top notch right uh wondering if i could be that that leader at that level was always like just kind of looming like how am i gonna be like I'm, i hope i'm gonna be great so and, and you only question yourself because you're around so many studs right from sf on down and foreign foreign countries one of my best friends patrick nyberg Shout out, Patrick. Uh, CSM in the Swedish Army, they only send one NCO every two years to the academy. So he's the one NCO out of two years that they sent that year. That's crazy. The man's amazing. Yeah. 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 Mechanized infantry, looks like a Viking. I mean, just. Do you guys have any other branches as well? Air Force, oh, Navy? Yeah, yeah. We, uh, yeah, we brought in the Air Force. I don't think we had any Navy that time. We had Coast Guard. We had Marines. Marines, yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, and I think we had 50 international students show up. Yeah. We had the uh, Sergeant Major of the Army in New Zealand. I got his coin. Amazing um, guy. He's very down to earth. Um, I remember, I believe he did the haka, one of our... Um, anyway, good good dude. I met amazing people, met amazing leaders, and it was an experience where, like I said, getting back to the basics... We didn't go over typical army things. A lot of it was st strategic level learning. So you go through like a month and three quarters of different um, functional areas where you learn about being a better leader at the strategic level. And you learn how to dress and you learn how to, because you're not going to be embarrassing to your counterpart who mm -hmm. you serve. Mm -hmm. right? You're not going to go out there and look like trash around your commander. Or whoever, right? The operations officer, if you're in, in... So they teach you how to dress. They teach you how to, you know, be strategic and, and be knowledgeable and educate yourself. So you had people out there earning their PhDs. You had people out there earning their master's degrees, earning, you know, bachelor's degrees. And then you had me that was learning how to be me as an individual without, you know, a whole bunch of people um, needing me for something. And that was weird. So what do I do with my hands? Yeah. Right. And I went from Auburn University as their senior military science instructor. Foundational learning, institutional learning, you know, young officers to the academy. So I went from <clears throat> still being needed and but as a teacher to being taught. Mm -hmm. So yeah, academy good. Um I thought I was going to one three nine. I forget the I forget where I was going. One three eight. I was supposed to be staying at Bliss. Yeah. And Stevie Jones was the CSM. Yeah. So I was going to be his ops arm major, which was just nice. going to be awesome at the, at the time. So I go in and say hi to him. I meet some of the first sergeants. I'm like, this is going to be all right. I didn't mind Bliss. It was going to be fine. Then this SFAB opportunity comes up. And um, explain my, what that is for those who may not be familiar with it. Sure thing. It's a, uh, and I'm not going to get too technical, but it's Security Force Assistance Brigade. And at the time of its inception, you know, we've always been doing security force assistance, but as its inception at the brigade level, as an actual conventional brigade uh, conducting security force assistance for foreign national um, armies, it was uh, new. So and it was it was also not well received at the time. Super that it, controversial. SF. The special forces um, were not happy about it. We're not happy about the uh, the beret, the whole thing yeah. that came out of it. It was uh, 
it became more of an army joke in the very beginning. Without to a be doubt. Honest. Yeah, and I was well, I was a part of that. The CAB was also when it first came out as well because of the CIB. Yeah. And you know, so I mean this this was one of those controversial things that you walked into in the very beginning. I, I that I volunteered for. Yeah. That's and that's yeah. what drove people crazy. There was like my, my boy Rod um was at the academy with me and he told me about it and Command Star Major Gunn was Christopher Gunn was selected to be the first CSM for first SVAB. And at that point, they were still deciding whether it was going to be a command or just that one brigade. Mm-hmm. I'm sure the powers that be already knew, but that's all we knew. And then Colonel Jackson, who's now General Jackson, um, was was the commander at the time. Yeah. So met up with them, and I was selected to be one of the operations our major straight out of the academy. And I thought that was the, the awesomest thing in the world. Um, fast forward, it's at Benning. I thought it was going to be a poke, honestly, because that's where they had the like a uh, um, advisor academy was down there at Poke, right? The Tiger Land. But we end up at, at Benning back on Kelly Hill, Zombie Land. Oh, yeah. That thing's crazy. Who's cutting the did, grass out there now? Yeah. Did you? No yeah, did, major detail. Good talk. You, t- you <laughs> took over where 197th and 3rd ID was? That, yeah, that, 197 yeah. or 3rd ID. Uh, yeah, did, Kelly it, Hill. Yeah, yeah. So isn't uh, isn't it still tumbleweeds out there? No, no. In oh. fact, what they did was is they moved. I haven't been back in a little while. You got three sixteen Cav, which is a you know part of uh, Tradoc, is running the um, man. I'm going to forget the name of it. It's the the training course for the advisors, right? Mm-hmm. So it's their training course, Cat C, mm. Combat Advisor Training Course. It's run by three sixteen Cav, which all right, cool. But it's right next to where it's 269, mm-hmm. it's barracks. That's that's the training cat, cat C. Oh, okay. And so you go in there, and that's where they do all the training. And it's become huge. The mm-hmm. motor pool across the street, they go out into the field. You learn how to be an advisor, and it's, it's like two months long now, I think. That's where you learn how to be an advisor. You get your identifier of being an advisor. Before that, we went through our own truncated version, and... Stop by SF, retired SF, you know, just whoever General Milley decided was going to be in there. The heartache, the blessing and the curse of General Milley was that, you know, being that he was or he is special forces, he took that concept of, you know, security force assistance and kind of pushed that down to the conventional side so there were a lot of nuances that were supposed to be just SF that started jumping into what we were doing on the conventional side, which was rubbing people the wrong way. Mm-hmm. The beret, not our idea. Yeah, right? the color Miller. of the beret, not General our Miller. idea. Um, being, you know, the legion, not our idea. He was the commander of Fifth um, Special Forces Group, which is the legion, like the real legion. Mm-hmm. And so. You know, it's every it, time we turn a corner, the beret uh, flash looks just like, just like yeah. fifth. Yeah, yep. mm. it was. So all these things were just rubbing people the wrong way, and I completely understand that because you know there's certain lines of operation that the SF does that nobody else will ever do. But you know, one of those things that they do is security for assistance, and that's that's the piece that we were touching. But we wanted. We wanted to create our own identity, but it's hard to do that when you're living in the shadow of something else. Yeah. And, you know, oh, you guys are just a MIT team and you're just this and you're just that. And and so you're having to glance all this stuff off and still t- tell people that they're relevant. So my career as a Sergeant Major was back to basics, right? On the range, going back to basics, teaching people how to shoot, teaching people how to do stuff the right way, um, learning how to do security force assistance. And then herding cats. Yeah. Because you don't have Joe there. No, we didn't have no. anybody there. My squadron had like 10 people in it when I showed up. Yeah. And, and th- that was my buddy worked out there. Um, and he said like all the Joe tasks fell to the staff sergeant. Staff sergeant sergeant first class. Yeah. 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 Like those dudes are, those dudes are Joe. So <laughs> those yeah. guys are sweeping up. Those guys I are, may or may not have mowed some lawns. Yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. Because like, Kelly Hill didn't look good when you guys showed yeah. up. And and you, it had to be maintained. Mm-hmm. And oh, by the way, you got to train. Right? Um, the OG, the plank holders, the people that started first SFAB are still pretty tight. And and um, 
That's where we lost Bolliard, Tim Bolliard. Yeah. That's Command Sergeant Major Bolliard. So I was his Ops Sergeant Major. It started off as when well, we ended up as, as Third Squadron, first SFAB. Ended up at Dalkey, which is basically South Shank. Yeah. It was adopted by the Afghan Army. And I won't get into the details, but, you know, six months in, um, Tim gets killed. Um, and that, that shook everybody because that was like his 13th deployment. And like two bronze star with Valor. I mean, the guy was a rock star, but so humble. And I learned a lot from him. I mean, we slept in the same time. I mean, shit, I was his operations sergeant major, so obviously we talked all the time. Um, that was tough. That was tough. You got to compartmentalize that, especially when you're downrange. Just, it was just dumb. Afghanistan rotation, though, I mean, in a very perverse way, I miss it. Um, you know, minus his passing, we lost a couple other good people, too. Um, but Dalkey and the relationships that I built with people and the friendships that I built with people and the things that I've learned about myself, uh, it was great. But I think that's where I started disconnecting myself. So there's that truth bomb. Started disconnecting myself from the military. Um, I didn't see myself getting picked up on a CSL. I was injured. Uh, I was trying not to milk an injury, but, you know, at, at the time, you know, I'd lost a bunch of weight and, you know, I was still working out. But if you're not deployable, you're not deployable. I had shoulder injuries, shoulder surgery, another shoulder injury. It's just, I mean, you just, it just started piling up. And if you're on profile, you're not getting picked up. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. So, I was blessed with the opportunity to go up and work as the SFAC. So as time progressed, the Army decides that they want to do a Security Force Assistance Command at one time, which was, you know, falling underneath 18th Airborne Corps, but then initially just, you know, falls under Forcecom. And within that command, they built four more brigades. So you go, you know, first is at Benning, second is at Bragg, third is at Hood, Fourth is at Carson, and fifth is up at Lewis or yep. JBLM. Or JBLM. Yep. And um, yeah, manning that monster, learning how to man that monster is the the recruiting sergeant major. It was a whole different animal, and um, I wish I could have been better at it. I left there unsatisfied. Well, you probably had to fight Branch a lot for for quality guys. I I had to fight. What I felt like is I had to fight a lot of different things. But you didn't have to fight just your branch. You had to fight every, every branch, branch because every branch was sending people to, you know, yeah. advise. So, there, it, I mean, when I got there, it was starting to change as far as how you recruited folks. So in-service recruiting was changing. Before, it was a shotgun blast. You know, you go out, you do a brief. Everybody hears about it. You get everybody's name. It gets thrown all at this small team. It is a very small team that was functioning, and they were they were good at what they were doing, but this small team was had to go through and filter through all these people that didn't want to just be at their, I don't want to be a poke, I want to go SFAB. So it was at that point that we start building these new standards, right? Um, Command, Sergeant, Command Sergeant Major Reese uh, Tickle, uh was there when I was there. There's another Ranger. Another high speed. It when it let me tell you something about Reese. If you didn't see the rank on his collar, you would have thought he was a field grade officer. Just the way he spoke. Yeah. And and how he carried himself. Super intelligent. And that's my opinion, and I'm sticking with it. Right. I don't <laughs> care what anybody else thinks. These are all my opinions. So if I have something good to say about somebody, it's it's real for me. I don't care your experiences with him, I'm telling you, the man is smart. And he knows what he's talking about. And you better know what you're talking about because you will be held accountable for your words. How many people do you know that just go out there and talk shit? A, a lot. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Words have consequences. Yeah. Yeah. yeah words matter. Yeah. They matter. They have consequences. So um, I learned a lot from him. Just, and I don't think he thinks I did, but I did. He helped me accountable. You know, as a 40 something year old sergeant major working at basically a division level. A lot of people in my position just think their their shit doesn't stink. And you could have hidden plain sight really well too. You just act busy and everyone would have thought you were busy. No mm -hmm. one's gonna question that. Um yeah. And it's stressful. Yeah. That I mean that job was stressful. We had uh 
major uh, david garcia was my guy um had nothing to do with sfa had nothing to do i mean he just logistician just doing it big and came in and i believe in my mind he rocked it he was killing it especially with the task that they gave him because that was a you know an o five position o four o five he came in as a major and he held his own you know Nice. So you know, good up, big up for for uh, for him, and um, but yeah, I, I I started disconnecting myself, and I I wish I would have given a little more. You know, if anybody had any comments about my performance at the S Fac, it probably would have been, I wish he would have given a little more, and and that's just me being honest, hundred with myself. Um, that's when I found out that I was getting med boarded, which was a humongous surprise. And that's how my transition started. I only had six months to get out. I had no plan. And how many years did you have in at this point? Um, I finished with 26. Damn. Yeah. I mean, I planned on doing 30. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to make CSL or not. But at, at any given time, I would have taken a command sergeant major position. And I think I would have thrived because that was my bag. Like, that's what I like. Mm-hmm. I like being in a position where I get to mentor and lead. And I just, man... There's, there's nothing like it, right? But I had been separated from that environment for so long, being with the SFAB, that I I don't think I would have thrived. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I've just, I got comfortable n- not being around being large comfortable. groups. Being yeah. comfortable, yeah. And so injury, plagued injuries, you know, hurt hurts your PT, Blah, blah. I mean, you didn't name it. Everything. It was a perfect storm for for me, um, just to kind of squeeze my way out of the military. And I didn't. I didn't want it. I wasn't ready. And you know, at the time, my fiance and I were just like, "What? The, what are we gonna do?" And so the sergeant major in me kicked in, and I just started planning, and I just started reaching out, and I'm just like, "Ey, here we come." Because I looked on LinkedIn, I had a buddy of mine that that uh, well, not a buddy of mine, my old boss tried to be an EY before he joined the military. He's a finance officer, and, um, and he reached out to me afterwards. I tell you that because of the significance of holding a position within a firm that, you know, grossed $45 billion last year. Yeah. That was huge. To be selected again in my life, to be a part of something that I deem is important, even if I'm just a resource manager. I'm not just a resource manager. I have the ability to change somebody's life by putting them in the wrong place or putting them in the right place. Right. Much like being a senior NCO or an officer. Mm -hmm. I I love that feeling because I bring a different flavor to being a resource manager with them. I speak with, with the people that I consider I work for. I speak with them. I touch base with them. We talk, we shoot the shit. We, I learn about them and their family because I want to know the person behind who I may or may not be affecting with yeah. how I assign, right? And um, man, it's carried me. It's, I tell people I chose that position. I didn't choose it to to get promoted. I, it, there's it's kind of a flat organization when you get to EM. You know, it's different when you're an auditor or you're a client server. It's a lot of climbing. Yeah, I'm not trying to outperform somebody for their job. I'm not. I'm in it for the experience, literally for the experience. At one point, it's not to put food on the table. I could be delivering packages for UPS. And no shit, I thought I was going to do that. I wanted to do that. I had the dog biscuits ready. <laughs> I was like, I got to find. The brown shorts. I got to find somebody to alter my shorts to get them really. <laughs> yeah, really yeah, that's it. I'm going to get the sleeves good, right? <laughs> Show the calves. Man, I was ready, ready. And um, I had applied for some jobs with UPS. I, I actually did in Alabama, and and they just weren't taking folks. I was like, I mean, I'm a baller, man. I've been driving Humvees forever. Yeah, let me get this. <laughs> um, but in the back of my mind, obviously, I wanted the good position, and it was there, and uh, I got blessed. I'm happy for you, man. I'm, yeah. I'm happy that you know you consider it probably um, you know coincidence or luck or whatever you want to call it and stuff. But there's a there's a path that's been laid out for you. Obviously, you know you've. You've, yeah. you've kind of fell into different positions 
probably because of your own efforts, but people recognizing you and what you've accomplished and through that way, uh, through your own journey and stuff. But, um, man, we could probably go on like another yeah. two more hours. <laughs> what I do want to do is, like I said earlier, I, and I wholeheartedly mean this, I'd love for you to come back. There's yeah, so many different that. topics and, and everything. That, yeah, and the fact that you're local, oh, yeah. Yeah. we, we want to hit on a number of different topics, and we'd love for you to sit down and uh, join in with us in conversation, man. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, like I said, I, I love doing this stuff. Um, and when I say this stuff, this is my first podcast ever, but I love being able to talk to people who can either relate or actually give a shit about what, yeah. what people have to say. Yeah. You guys are genuinely like, I've known him forever. He's had to listen to my bullshit forever. <laughs> and so it pleasures me to sit here and have him listen to me again. Yeah. Cause he has no choice. You're the first one of my leaders I've asked on here, man. <laughs> I love I'm just friend, letting man. you know. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, man. but this is great. Appreciate it. Thank you.